Sketches by Boz, Section 19. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Brad Philippone. Sketches by Boz, Section 19. Scenes, Chapter 12. Greenwich Fair. If the parks be the lungs of London, we wonder what Greenwich Fair is. A periodical breaking out, we suppose, a sort of spring rash, a three days fever which cools the blood for six months afterwards, and at the expiration of which London is restored to its old habits of plodding industry as suddenly and completely as if nothing had ever happened to disturb them. In our earlier days we were a constant frequenter of Greenwich Fair for years. We have proceeded to, and returned from it, in almost every description of vehicle. We cannot conscientiously deny the charge of having once made the passage in a spring van, accompanied by thirteen gentlemen, fourteen ladies, an unlimited number of children, and a barrel of beer. And we have a vague recollection of having, in later days, found ourselves the eighth outside on the top of a hackney-coach at something past four o'clock in the morning, with a rather confused idea of our own name or place of residence. We have grown older since then, and quiet and steady liking nothing better than to spend our Easter and all our other holidays in some quiet nook, with people of whom we shall never tire, but we think we still remember something of Greenwich Fair and of those who resort to it. At all events, we will try. The road to Greenwich, during the whole of Easter Monday, is in a state of perpetual bustle and noise. Cabs, hackney-couches, shay-carts, coal-wagons, stages, omnibuses, sociables, gigs, donkey-chases, all crammed with people, for the question never is what the horse can draw, but what the vehicle will hold, roll along at their utmost speed. The dust flies in clouds, ginger-beer corks go off in volleys, the balcony of every public house is crowded with people, smoking and drinking, half the private houses are turned into tea-shops, fiddles are in great request, every little fruit-shop displays its stall of gilt gingerbread and penny toys, turnpike men are in despair, horses won't go on, and wheels will come off, ladies in caravans scream with fright in every fresh concussion, and their admirers find it necessary to sit remarkably close to them by way of encouragement, servants of all work who are not allowed to have followers, and have got a holiday for the day, make the most of their time with the faithful admirer who waits for the stolen interview at the corner of the street every night, when they go to fetch the beer apprentices grow sentimental, and straw-bonnet makers kind. Everybody is anxious to get on, and actuated by the common wish to be at the fair or in the park as soon as possible. Pedestrians linger in groups at the roadside, unable to resist the allurements of the stout proprietress of the jack-in-the-box three shies a penny, or the more splendid offers of the man with three thimbles and a pea on a little round board, who astonishes the bewildered crowd with some such address as, "'Here's the sort of game to make you laugh seven years after you're dead, and turn every air on your head grey with delight. Three thimbles and von little pea, with a von, two, three, and a two, three, von. Catch em who can. Look on. Keep your eyes open and never say die. Never mind the change in the expense.' All fair and above board, them as don't play can vin, and luck attend the royal sportsman. Bet any gentleman any sum of money from half a crowd up to a sovereign, as he doesn't name the thimble as kivers the pea. Here some greenhorn whispers his friend that he distinctly saw the pea roll under the middle thimble, an impression which is immediately confirmed by a gentleman in top boots who is standing by, and who, in a low tone, regrets his own inability to bet, in consequence of having unfortunately left his purse at home, but strongly urges the stranger not to neglect such a golden opportunity. The plant is successful, the bet is made, the stranger of course loses, and the gentleman with the thimbles consoles him as he pockets the money, with an assurance that it's all the fortune of war. This time I've in, next time you've in, never mind the loss of two bob and a bender, do it up in a small parcel and break out in a fresh place. Here's the sort of game, etc., and the eloquent harangue, with such variations as the speaker's exuberant fancy suggests, is again repeated to the gaping crowd, reinforced by the accession of several newcomers. 
The chief place of resort in the daytime, after the public houses, is the park, in which the principal amusement is to drag young ladies up the steep hill which leads to the observatory, and then drag them down again at the very top of their speed, greatly to the derangement of their curls and bonnet caps, and much to the edification of lookers-on from below. Kiss in the ring and threading my grandmother's needle, too, are sports which receive their full share of patronage. Lovesick swains under the influence of gin and water, and the tender passion become violently affectionate, and the fair objects of their regard enhance the value of stolen kisses by a vast deal of struggling and holding down of heads and cries of, Oh, had done then, George! Oh, do tickle him for me, Mary! Well, I never! and similar Lucretian ejaculations. Little old men and women with a small basket under one arm and a wine-glass without a foot in the other hand, tender a drop of the right sort to the different groups, and young ladies who are persuaded to indulge in a drop of the aforesaid right sort, display a pleasing degree of reluctance to taste it, and cough afterwards with great propriety. The old pensioners, who for the moderate change of a penny exhibit the mast-house, the Thames and shipping, the place where the men used to hang in chains and other interesting sights through a telescope, are asked questions about objects within the range of the glass, which it would puzzle Solomon to answer, and requested to find out particular houses in particular streets, which it would have been a task of some difficulty for Mr. Horner, not the young gentleman who ate mince pies with his thumb, but the man of Coliseum notoriety, to discover. Here and there, where some three or four couples are sitting on the grass together, you will see a sunburnt woman in a red cloak telling fortunes, and prophesying husbands, which it requires no extraordinary observation to describe, for the originals are before her. Thereupon, the lady concerned laughs and blushes, and ultimately buries her face in an imitation cambric handkerchief, and the gentleman described looks extremely foolish, and squeezes her hand, and fees the gypsy liberally, and the gypsy goes away, perfectly satisfied herself, and leaving those behind her perfectly satisfied also, and the prophecy, like many other prophecies of greater importance, fulfills itself in time. But it grows dark. The crowd has gradually dispersed, and only a few stragglers are left behind. The light in the direction of the church shows that the fair is illuminated, and the distant noise proves it to be filling fast. The spot which half an hour ago was ringing with the shouts of boisterous mirth is as calm and quiet as if nothing could ever disturb its serenity. The fine old trees, the majestic building at their feet, with the noble river beyond, glistening in the moonlight, appear in all their beauty, and under their most favourable aspect, the voices of the boys, singing their evening hymn, are borne gently on the air, and the humblest mechanic who has been lingering on the grass so pleasant to the feet that beat the same dull round from week to week in the paved streets of London, feels proud to think, as he surveys the scene before him, that he belongs to the country which has selected such a spot as a retreat for its oldest and best defenders in the decline of their lives. Five minutes' walking brings you to the fair, a scene calculated to awaken very different feelings. The entrance is occupied on either side by the vendors of gingerbread and toys, the stalls are gaily lighted up, the most attractive goods profusely disposed, and unbonneted young ladies, in their zeal for the interest of their employers, seize you by the coat and use all the blandishments of, do, dear, there's a love, don't be cross now, etc., to induce you to purchase half a pound of the real spice nuts, of which the majority of the regular fair-goers carry a pound or two as a present supply, tied up in a cotton pocket-handkerchief. Occasionally you pass a deal-table, on which are exposed penn'orths of pickled salmon, fennel included, in little white saucers, oysters with shells as large as cheese-plates, and divers specimens of a species of snails, wilks we think they are called, floating in a somewhat bilious-looking green liquid. Cigars, too, are in great demand. Gentlemen must smoke, of course, and here they are, to a penny, in a regular authentic cigar-box, with a lighted tallow candle in the centre. Imagine yourself in an extremely dense crowd, which swings you to and fro, and in and out, and every way but the right one. Add to this the screams of women, the shouts of boys, the clanging of gongs, the firing of pistols, the ringing of bells, the bellowings of speaker-trumpets, the squeaking of penny-dittos 
the noise of a dozen bands with three drums in each all playing different tunes at the same time the hallowing of showmen and an occasional roar from the wild beast shows and you are in the very centre and heart of the fair this immense booth with the large stage in front so brightly illuminated with variegated lamps and pots of burning fat is richardson's where you have a melodrama with three murders and a ghost a pantomime a comic song an overture and some incidental music all done in five-and-twenty minutes the company are now promenading outside in all the dignity of wigs spangles red ochre and whitening see with what a ferocious air the gentleman who personates the mexican chief paces up and down and with what an eye of calm dignity the principal tragedian gazes on the crowd below or converses confidentially with the harlequin the four clowns who are engaged in mock broadsword combat may be all very well for the low-minded holiday-makers but these are the people for the reflective portion of the community they look so noble in these roman dresses with their yellow legs and arms long black curly heads bushy eyebrows and scowled expressive of assassination and vengeance and everything else that is grand and solemn then the ladies were there ever such innocent and awful-looking beings as they walk up and down the platform in twos and threes with their arms round each other's waists or leaning for support on one of those majestic men their spangled muslin dresses and blue satin shoes and sandals a little the worse for wear are the admiration of all beholders and the playful manner in which they check the advances of the clown is perfectly enchanting just a going to begin pray come forward come forward exclaims the man in the countryman's dress for the seventeenth time and people force their way up and down the steps in crowds the band suddenly strikes up the harlequin and columbine set the example reels are formed in less than no time the roman heroes place their arms akimbo and dance with considerable agility the leading tragic actress and the gentleman who enacts the swell in the pantomime foot it to perfection all in to begin shouts the manager when no more people can be induced to come forward and away rush the leading members of the company to do the dreadful in the first piece a change of performance takes place every day during the fair but the story of the tragedy is always pretty much the same there is a rightful heir who loves a young lady and is beloved by her and a wrongful heir who loves her too and isn't beloved by her and the wrongful heir gets hold of the rightful heir and throws him into a dungeon just to kill him off when convenient for which purpose he hires a couple of assassins a good one and a bad one who the moment they are left alone get up a little murder on their own account the good one killing the bad one and the bad one wounding the good one then the rightful heir is discovered in prison carefully holding a long chain in his hands and seated despondingly in a large armchair and the young lady comes in to two bars of soft music and embraces the rightful heir and then the wrongful heir comes in to two bars of quick music technically called a hurry and goes on in the most shocking manner throwing the young lady about as if she was nobody and calling the rightful heir a recreant a wretch in a very loud voice which answers the double purpose of displaying his passion and preventing the sound from being deadened by the sawdust the interest becomes intense the wrongful heir draws his sword and rushes on the rightful heir a blue smoke is seen a gong is heard and a tall white figure who has been all this time behind the armchair covered over with a tablecloth slowly rises to the tune of oft in the stilly night this is no other than the ghost of the rightful heir's father who was killed by the wrongful heir's father at sight of which the wrongful heir becomes apoplectic and is literally struck all of a heap the stage not being large enough to admit of his falling down at full length then the good assassin staggers in and says he was hired in conjunction with the bad assassin by the wrongful heir to kill the rightful heir and he's killed a good many people in his time but he's very sorry for it and won't do so any more a promise which he immediately redeems by it dying off-hand without any nonsense about it then the rightful heir throws down his chain and then two men a sailor and a young woman the tenantry of the rightful heir come in and the ghost makes dumb motions to them which they by supernatural interference understand for no one else can and the ghost who can't do anything without blue fire blesses the rightful heir and the young lady by half suffocating them with smoke and then a muffin bell rings and the curtain drops 
The exhibitions next in popularity to these itinerant theatres are the travelling menageries, or to speak more intelligibly, the wild beast shows, where a military band in beef-eater's costume with leopard-skin caps play incessantly, and where large, highly coloured representations of tigers tearing men's heads open, and a lion being burnt with red-hot irons to induce him to drop his victim, are hung up outside by way of attracting visitors. The principal officer at these places is generally a very tall horseman in a scarlet coat with a cane in his hand, with which he occasionally wraps the pictures we have just noticed, by way of illustrating his description, something in this way. Hear, 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 the lion, the lion, tap, exactly as he is represented on the canvas outside, three taps, no waiting, remember, no description, the ferocious lion, tap, tap, who bit off the gentleman's head last Camberville, was a twelve-month and has killed, on the average, three keepers a year ever since he arrived at maturity. No extra charge on this account, recollect, the price of admission is only sixpence. This address never fails to produce a considerable sensation, and sixpences flow into the treasury with wonderful rapidity. The dwarfs are also objects of great curiosity, and as a dwarf, a giantess, a living skeleton, a wild Indian, a young lady of singular beauty with perfectly white hair and pink eyes, and two or three other natural curiosities are usually exhibited together for the small charge of a penny. They attract very numerous audiences. The best thing about a dwarf is that he always has a little box about two feet six inches high, into which by long practice he can just manage to get by doubling himself up like a bootjack. This box is painted outside like a six-roomed house and as the crowd see him ring a bell or fire a pistol out to the first-floor window, they verily believe that it is his ordinary town residence, divided like other mansions into drawing-rooms, dining-parlour, and bedchambers. Shut up in this case, the unfortunate little object is brought out to delight the throng by holding a facetious dialogue with the proprietor, in the course of which the dwarf, who is always particularly drunk, pledges himself to sing a comic song inside, and pays various compliments to the lady which induce them to come forward with great alacrity. As a giant is not so easily moved, a pair of indescribables of most capacious dimensions and a huge shoe are usually brought out into which two or three stout men get all at once, to the enthusiastic delight of the crowd, who are quite satisfied with the solemn assurance that these habiliments form part of the giant's everyday costume. The grandest and most numerously frequented booth in the whole fair, however, is the Crown and Anchor, a temporary ballroom. We forget how many hundred feet long, the price of admission to which is one shilling. Immediately on your right hand as you enter, after paying your money, is a refreshment place, at which cold beef, roast and boiled, French rolls, stout wine, tongue, ham, even fowls, if we recollect right, are displayed in tempting array. There is a raised orchestra, and the place is boarded all the way down in patches just wide enough for a country dance. There is no master of the ceremonies in this artificial Eden. All is primitive, unreserved, and unstudied. The dust is blinding, the heat insupportable, the company somewhat noisy, and in the highest spirits possible, the ladies, in the height of their innocent animation, dancing in the gentlemen's hats, and the gentlemen promenading the gay and festive scene in the ladies' bonnets, or with the most expensive ornaments of false noses and low-crowned tinder-box-looking hats, playing children's drums and accompanied by ladies on the penny trumpet. The noise of these various instruments, the orchestra, the shouting, the scratchers, and the dancing is perfectly bewildering. The dancing itself beggars description. Every figure lasts about an hour, and the ladies bounce up and down the middle with a degree of spirit which is quite indescribable. As to the gentlemen, they stamp their feet against the ground every time hands four round begins, go down the middle and up again with cigars in their mouths and silk handkerchiefs in their hands, and whirl their partners round, nothing loth, scrambling and falling and embracing, and knocking up against the other couples until they are fairly tired out and can move no longer. The same scene is repeated again and again, slightly varied by an occasional row, until a late hour at night, and a great many clerks and prentices find themselves next morning with aching heads, empty pockets, damaged hats, and a very imperfect recollection of how it was they did not get home. End of section 19